It is my great pleasure and privilege today to introduce Pastor Andrew Alvin as our guest speaker for today. Pastor Andrew Alvin is a great friend, a great servant of the Lord, and a great preacher of God's Word. Over these years, as we know him, we have grown to appreciate the great gift of God upon his life and the apostolic anointing that is so clearly seen in him. He has touched lives across continents. And today, I'm sure, as we bring to us God's Word, we will be enlightened, encouraged, and edified by what God is going to say through Him. So open your hearts and let God speak to you as Pastor Andrew Owen brings us God's Word today. Hey, it's great to be with you today. I'm delighted and privileged to bring the Word of God to you today. We love you guys. We've missed seeing you at your conference and we are just so delighted and pleased with our relationship and friendship with Pastor Daniel and Pastor Deborah. Uh, we so much value those guys, their input into our lives and we're so delighted that we can journey together. So as we turn to the Word of God today, we're talking about facing forward for the future and unlocking our vision, making the vision a reality. There's a few things that I want to share with you. The Collins English Dictionary decided that its word for the year 2020 was the word lockdown. And that's not unsurprising, right? As the whole planet's been in a lockdown here uh, in Scotland, We've been in our fourth lockdown and we haven't met as a church for a year now. But it's been an awesome year, an amazing year. Because I think that while the dictionary in the world has decided that the word for the year was lockdown, I think God's word for the year and the year that lies ahead is unlock. God is unlocking the church. God is unlocking your life. God is unlocking your potential. And God is unlocking locking your opportunities. As we've gone through this challenge and we're facing forward for the one that's coming, we need to reflect on a few things. I think, first of all, God has brought the church back to basics, the simplest building blocks that make church, church. And do you know what? We have the exact same building blocks that the early church had. They didn't have the internet. They didn't have planes and cars. They, they, they didn't have mobile phones or television. But you know what? Without one building, they reached the entire known world in one generation. And so here we are today. God is unlocking our potential. We still have the Bible, the Word of God. We certainly still have the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. We still have the privilege and the prerogative in prayer. We still have Ephesians 4 ministries to equip us and to empower us. What they had then, we've got now. And so, you know what? God wants to unlock the church and unlock your potential by unlocking fresh and new opportunities. But I do think there's something that we need to pay attention to when we reflect and consider the early church and us. I think we need to come back and see and understand the way the early church thought. I think the 21st century church has drifted away from first century church thinking. And of course, you will know that the Bible teaches us as a man thinks within himself, so he is. So while we're talking about facing forward and our vision under this heading, Unlock, I'm really focusing on a comparison and a contrast between the way the church today thinks and the church then thought. So here are a few things. The church then thought process, but we've began to think more about programs. You know, what's in the diary? What's coming up? What have we scheduled in? And in this pandemic, our programs have had to go out the window. But the early church, they didn't think programs, they thought process. In other words, they knew God was doing something. That was their deep conviction. And they believed in something that we call restoration. In Acts 3.21, we read this, For he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things 
as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. Here's the apostle preaching, and he's saying, Jesus isn't coming back just yet because God is doing something which he called restoration. There's a process, an activity taking place where God is engaging with his church and the world. The word restoration, also translated restitution, is only used once in the New Testament, but it means to re-establish something. And it speaks of a process and a moment when things begin to come together. It's actually God working to the fullness of his plan to bring his kingdom into its utmost reality. As above in heaven, so below on earth. God is doing something. And they knew that whatever was going on around them, God was in control, God was at work, and God was working out his kingdom plan. So whatever's going on around us, we need to know God is working through a process. He's been restoring things. And not only has he been restoring, he's putting things back in this year, I think, taking us back to basics, but he's been restoring things through church history. If you were to take a moment and to look at church history, you would see certain pivotal points when God put something back that the church had lost from its beginnings. We remember Martin Luther and the Reformation. What did he put back in through his revelation? Justification by faith. He began to preach the real gospel of grace. We then find after him came the Anabaptists and they began to preach water baptism an essential foundation for believers today. Then after them, we discover that the power of the Holy Spirit is put back into the church. When I became a Christian, I couldn't find anybody who was baptized in the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. Now everybody is. Then we've discovered that God has been replacing into the church the gift of faith and of healing. Then we've been understanding the place of the church. This is God's great plan, God's great idea. And of course, as we've been doing church, we've rediscovered afresh the beauty of just living dynamic worship. Um, we've been discovering the importance of corporate fellowship and prayer together. You see, God's always been working. And as we face forward, we need to lock into his plans, not ask him to lock into our program. And as we move with him, it's going to succeed. Everything Jesus does succeeds. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But you know what? When we look at the early church, here's another thing that they thought compared and contrasted with what we think. We think, watch this, we think heaven, but they thought resurrection. You see, even today when we preach the gospel, we will often say, if you want to go to heaven, and we think our hope is in heaven and we want to get to heaven. But you know what? The early church never thought about going to heaven. The whole concept of the strong preaching about going to heaven did not appear to later Thomas Aquinas and others. What did the early church think about? They, their biggest hope was a resurrection. One day, there's going to be a resurrection around you, a new earth, a new heaven, a new body. The kingdom will come and we're going to be fully functioning in it. That was their hope. And do you know what? You have to look at the big things while you're doing the small things so that the small things go in the direction of the big things. I've discovered that not so many young people are interested in talking about heaven. You know why? They want to make a difference in this world and they want to make a difference that lasts with their life. And so if Jesus doesn't come before you die, you will go to heaven if you're a Christian. But it's a hotel an amazing hotel, but it's only a temporary place. The beautiful thing about heaven is that God himself is there, absent in the body, present with the Lord. But you know what? That isn't our final destination. Our final destination is a resurrection around you. The kingdom is coming. I'm going to live forever. Then we discover that so often we think world and they think kingdom. Isn't it true today that so many people, particularly young people, are concerned about our planet? And so we should be. God created this and we should look after it. But we need to know that God is not in the process of redeeming the world or the worldly systems. God is not involved with what is happening in that. You see, we understand 
that the world is already judged. That's what Jesus said. We already understand that the world is passing away. The world system is not going to become Christian. And so often we have been preaching and we have been training to succeed in the world. When the early church thought about succeeding in the kingdom and influencing the world, the Bible teaches us a hard fact. It says this, those who make friends with the world will be at enmity with God. James 4 verse 4 says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. And of course, when the Bible speaks about the world, it's not talking about people or people groups. It's talking about the the dark satanic systems that operate within that world. And we forget lists like the big faith list in Hebrews, which says people gave up, let go of things in this world because their hope was in the kingdom of God. Listen to me. You can raise your kids to be successful in the world, but they miss the kingdom entirely. And the world is seductive. You know what? It's possible to raise kids in a church to be successful in the world, but they've forgotten to make Jesus the Lord of their life. Listen, we're not here to make a name. We're here to serve a name. And here's the beautiful promise. Jesus said, if you seek first the kingdom, then all these other things will be added to you. Never has the teaching of the kingdom been so important. Jesus is to be the Lord of my life. And that brings us on to a third thing in the way that we think and they, the early church, thought. You see, we think of Jesus as Savior. They thought of Jesus as Lord. We even preach the gospel, accept Jesus as your Savior. And of course, he is our Savior. But that's not what they preached. They preached Jesus as Lord. And in Romans 10, of course, we learn and remember Whoever confesses with his mouth Jesus as Lord shall be saved. You see, it's one thing having Jesus as your Savior to get a seat to heaven. But when Jesus is your Lord, you will live for him. Boy, you'll have a vision, but you'll have something bigger than a vision. You'll have a cause. Twice Jesus said this, for the Son, for this cause, the Son of Man came. You know what? You can live for a vision, but you will die for a cause. And God is raising up a generation of people who are willing to die for this cause. Give it everything. And you know what? It's worth giving yourself for. Therefore, when Jesus is Lord, he's Lord of my life, my time, my gifts, my talents, my money, everything. I'm living for him. If I'm running a business, I'm running it for him. If I'm in government, I'm there as his ambassador, as his representative. If I'm a father in the house, that household is where Jesus is to be Lord. And do you know what? It was a very dangerous thing to say that in the days of the early church because Caesar was Lord, right? Jesus, uh, Caesar took upon himself divinity or deity, declared himself to be God and wanted to be worshipped. And so if you said somebody else was Lord, that was dangerous talk. It could get you killed. But that is exactly what they preached. And do you know what? Because they preached Jesus as Lord, they expected that that lordship, that kingship, that power that Jesus had would be displayed. Where? It would be displayed on the streets with the sick people. Where? It would be displayed when there was lack. God would supernaturally provide for them. Where would Jesus, his Lord's lordship be, be portrayed? When God would open palaces and kings would listen to the gospel. Where was Jesus being Lord? Jesus was being Lord when that, that young lad Eutychus fell out of the window dropped to the earth of dead and Paul raised him from the dead. Why is that? Because Jesus is Lord even over death. You know, we need to preach the kingdom and we need to preach the Lordship of Christ, that Jesus is Lord over all. Every name that is named, he's above it. Every principality, authority and power that seeks to darken our world, Jesus is above it. And it's he that has become our Lord and Savior. And then in this First part, finally, I want to say this. They thought belonging, we think buildings. So many churches have been at a loss because they've not been able to use their buildings, us included, right? But you know what? It was said of Jesus prophetically, or Jesus said prophetically, a body you have prepared for me, not a building you bought for me. You see, the, the mission with which we are 
engaged. The vision that is offered to us is not buildings dependent. It's body dependent. Where I go, God goes. Where I go, Jesus is Lord. And where I go, the Holy Spirit is within me. Belonging is more important. The key word for our hour is discipleship, bringing people in and taking them on. We, as a ministry, have had the best year ever in our entire 35 years of existence through the lockdown. Of course, everything's gone online, but through online, we have launched multi-language services. More than 30 new nations have opened up where churches and life groups have been planted. We have run alpha programs and seen so many people come to know Jesus. This has been the best season and we haven't used one building. Why is that? Because the bodies walking around called Christians have simply said, we're available. So in the challenging moment, let's think like the early church thought. The best is actually yet to come. As we were saying, the key word out there in the world has been lockdown, but I think the key word in the church and in the kingdom is unlock. And as we are reflecting on facing forward for a dynamic vision, God is unlocking his church. And we've been saying that one of the ways that that's been happening is that we've gone back to basics, church has become simple, but we need to be careful that we think the same way as the early church thought. And there's one other area that I'd like to point out. We think today working for God. They thought working with God. Do you remember the story in Acts when they were persecuted uh, because the apostles had raised that layman on his feet and now every Jewish person leader was jealous and envious and wanted to shut them down. And so they had a prayer meeting. And the Bible says that they prayed like this, God grant your servants boldness that we may proclaim. And do you know what it then says? And the Lord worked with them. And there were many signs and wonders and healings that took place. I once misread a verse in the New Testament for years the verse, you'll know it no doubt, goes like this. With men, these things are impossible. But with God, all things are possible. I read that verse wrongly. I read it like this. For God, all things are possible. But that isn't what it says. The verse actually says, with God, all things are possible. You see, God does not want anyone working for him. He wants people working with him. And in that little verse in the Gospels, the word with is the Greek word para, where of course we get parachute or paraglider from, or the famous parakletos, the word for the comforter. It means coming alongside. And God, they saw life as an adventure because God was in them. God was with them wherever they were going. Jesus was the Lord of their lives. So anything could happen. And I need to tell you, we've had an adventure this last year. Everything is up, including our finances. Everything has jumped and moved up. What we've been doing in terms of the mercy ministries, feeding the poor, has jumped. Everything has just moved to another level. So often it seemed such an impossibility. We started a hot food program, cooking hot meals for people from scratch. Never done it before. And we've just crossed 100,000 hot meals given. How did all that happen? God provided. God made a way. God worked with us and we worked with him. If you go out to work for God, you'll be burnt out before you know it. You'll be downcast and discouraged before the day is done. And too many Christians and Christian leaders are like that. But God wants people working with him so that it becomes an adventure. So let me point out some things that I think we can do now to unlock the vision of the future, to bring into the present the hopes of our dream. Here are 10 things that I think we can do. Number one, stay faithful to your God and to your calling. This is not the time to go AWOL or leave your post from being a servant. Maybe you're serving opportunity. 
has closed down because so much of it was meeting dependent. But you know what? Stay faithful. Be a servant. I want to make a difference. And then secondly, identify God activity moments. What is God doing now in this situation within which I can move? You see, so many people were made redundant when church meetings closed down. We didn't need the worship band as much as we did, or the kids' program perhaps, or the stewards, or all those technicians, or all those people cooking meals and making coffee and the greeters, and all of those people that make church church happen in a meeting. But you know what? Every one of them is still just as important. There are new opportunities. All our pastors have to be trained to be online pastors, how to run meetings online, and to counsel people. Do you know one of the most amazing things I've seen through the lockdown is many people baptized in the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, speaking in tongues through Zoom. Can't even touch them, but they've experienced it anyway. We have had hundreds of people healed online through Zoom healing meetings. We had to reprogram, retrain, but you know what? We've been noticing what God is doing and moving in there with him. As there's a lovely phrase from the Message Bible. It talks about the rhythms of grace. I promise you that right around your life and right around your church, there is a rhythm of grace. Spot it, identify it, reposition and get in on it. Then thirdly, this is a season to make sure that what you have is strong, clear and ready for growth. If you like, it's amending the nets time. Is your discipleship process dis substantial? Is your database strong and functioning? Do you know who you've got in your church and in your groups? Do you know what's going on? Is it ready for growth? Because I'm telling you, growth is coming. Then I think the most important thing, in fact, we say this as a, as a ministry, this is our number one thing. There's never been a better moment than this to make disciples. Every one of us needs a handful of people that we are working with. Here at Destiny, we've got a big pile of resources available if you need to use them or would like to have an opportunity to get a hold of them. Designed to disciple people. We have, a, we have two things that we train our pastors with. We often say to our pastors, listen, take every person at least one step forward. Take them forward at least one step in the things of God and leave no one behind. And so people are struggling or they're, they're struggling with their walk with God. We make sure that we're there catching them and bringing them forward. It's about discipleship making. And isn't that what Jesus told us to do? Go and make disciples. Fifthly, what have you been doing that you need to close? You see, not all projects that the church gets involved with are there forever. They're servant projects. The season has changed. And listen, the world is never going to go back the way it was pre-COVID. It's changed forever. Sure, we're going to have fellowship. Sure, we're going to meet with each other. But online church and many other initiatives are here to stay for good. And so maybe there are some projects that are no longer necessary. It's an opportunity to take a fresh look. And do you know what I've discovered? Ordinary people, even people who are not Christians, have been looking at their life through the lockdown and saying, I don't need to be doing this or doing that anymore. Here in the UK, property prices in London have begun to go down because people have realized we don't need to be in the city to work anymore. The property prices in rural areas, beside the seaside, in, a, in attractive places, have gone up because they're all wanting to go out and work out there from their homes. They've been making adjustments on the things they've been buying and spending their money on. Um, we haven't been able to eat out in a restaurant for I don't know, goodness knows how long. I miss it immensely eating out, but you know what? We've saved a ton of money not doing it. What do you need to close church-wise or ministry-wise? Then, sixthly, there has been no better time than now to reach out to others, especially through social media, to make a connection. Loneliness is the pandemic. Suicide rates have rocketed. People are deeply struggling. Um, marriages are under pressure. Parents are under pressure with all that's gone on. It creates 
a beautiful opportunity for the gospel of Jesus. And so to unlock the future, reach out, start touching, start connecting, start asking, start offering prayer, start offering help or assistance to people. Reach out like never before. Seventhly, and I think this is really, really important, especially for our churches and those of us involved with them. This is a time to give personal time to kids, youth, and young people. Let's build the next generation. Sometimes we make the mistake of saying they are the church of tomorrow when actually they are the church of today. And one of the things that I have been so blessed with through this lockdown season is to see so many young people step up to the plate and lead ministries with us, take initiative, carry weight and reach out. Some of them haven't even been Christians very long, but suddenly they're not the church of tomorrow, they're the church of today. And we need to invest in them. You know, we used to think, those of us who are older, that you needed a cool young youth pastor to reach the youth. That is no longer the case. You need a youth pastor, no doubt, but you need, they need fathers and grandfathers. They need people to love on them, to spend time with them, to listen to them, to tell them stories about adventures with God and to nurture them and to encourage them. This young generation, the most tech savvy we've ever seen, so many of them don't have a friend in the world because they've only got virtual friends. Some of them don't know a real person in life because they've only got gamers to game with, but never even met a soul. They don't, they're not comfortable in relationships. And so we have to reach out and help them. Then, I think this is important for us as we unlock the future going forward. Do you know what? Now is the time to advertise or to make your church known. Guess what? When things lift and there's far more freedom and opportunity to move around, it's your church name that they'll remember because it was out there and up there. And then this is a time of meeting need like never before. That's the best way to make your church known. You know, there's so many needs in our community. We need to be extending uh, our friendship. We need to find a hurt and heal it. We find a need and meet it. That's what church looks like. And through that, so many people will have a God encounter. Maybe they can't or don't want to listen to your message, but they'll receive your act of kindness. Then ninthly, nearly there, this is a time to work hard at finding people a new place to serve, a new ministry. We're not quite sure what's going to happen with church and the meetings and the programs and all those things that are once we were so familiar with, but it's time to retrain. Um, on any given weekend, we will have 20 to 100 pastors online during the service, offering prayer, getting involved in the chat, ministering to people, moving in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, praying for the sick, leading people to Christ. And then all of that continues during the week. Facebook, uh, Instagram, phone calls, food supply, reaching out in friendship. So many new opportunities right now that we need to train our people. Listen, the future is significantly bright. God wants it to grow. But here's how things grow, especially church-wise. Here's a principle that's buried in there in the book of Ephesians. The Bible says, the body builds itself up when every joint supplies. Right, prayer is important. Prayer and fasting is important. We're doing that right now here. Evangelism is important. Preaching the gospel is hugely important. But here is a growth principle. When every person in your small group or every person in your church has a job, and they are responsible for something, and they are doing something. The Bible says the body will build itself up when every joint supplies. Even the newest person walking through your door, God's brought them in because there's a place for them. If you are a pastor or you are a leader or you are a ministry, it is your role to find them that job and help them get into it. And then, tenthly, and finally, you need to make a decision to thrive, not just survive. 
God's people do best under pressure. It's when that pandemic is at its worst, we should be at our best. God really does want you to thrive. Paul says in Philippians, he said this, I know how to abound. And that word abound is thrive. I know how to thrive. When everything else is dark, I know how to thrive. And you know how we can thrive? Picking up some basic keys of the New Testament that's offered to us through Christ Jesus. We break bread almost every single day here. Why is that? Is it a religious ritual? No, it's a point of contact with Jesus himself. I'm touching that covenant. I'm using my faith. I believe in God that today is going to be a good day, that his promise is for me, that even if the doors are closing in one place, they're going to open in another. Even if those people are against me, God is for me. My confession, how I speak about the moment, and then I constantly embrace and submit to the Lordship of Christ. Jesus is Lord of my health. Jesus is Lord of my money. Jesus is Lord of my church. Jesus is even Lord of this world. And wherever I go, I'm bringing his Lordship with me. And you know what? There's a beautiful promise in James, which says this, that if we submit ourselves to God, he's Lord, and resist the devil, he will flee from us. The future will not be a walk in the park. It's not going to be a stroll in the countryside. It's going to be full of challenges, but challenges we will win. There's going to be some resisting to do of the devil and embracing of the promises of God. There is going to be times when we are going to have to fight, but you know what? We're on a side that's already won. And so, while the world is saying lockdown, God is saying unlock. Potentially and possibly you're listening to this message today and as yet you don't know God personally. Do you know you can not know about him but know him and most importantly he knows you. The Bible tells us and teaches us that man and God were forever separated because of the sin in our lives but at a most strategic moment, God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into this world to die on a cross. He didn't die because it was a tragic mistake. He died by a divine design because when he was on that cross, our sins were placed on him. And when I come and believe that, and I look that way, I can come to God the Father and say, I can come to you through your son, Jesus, and your Holy Spirit can live in me. It's a relationship, not a religion. Maybe today you would like to know God personally. Would you let me pray for you? Listen, if it's possible, where you are, you may be on your own, sitting in your home, you may be with some friends sharing. If it's possible, and you know I need to know God, I want to know Jesus, I want to come into God's family, could you lift your hand or open your hands and let me pray for you. Father, I pray for my friends today. I want to thank you that you know them by name and love them so much with all of your heart. I pray that today you will come into their lives, save them, that they would know the power of your forgiveness, that they would make Jesus the Lord of their life, and in so doing, you will become their Savior. I want to thank you, God, that you want to fill them really quickly with the Holy Spirit to empower them for life. I commit them to the Word of your grace. Friends, we love you so much. If you prayed that prayer, it's really important that you let somebody around you know, maybe one of the pastors or the leaders with you, and I'm sure that they will help you take the next step forward. Listen, God wants you working with him. Enjoy the adventure that's coming. I'm Andrew Owens, Destiny Church. God bless. 
Now, what a powerful word we've heard this morning. And if you are feeling a nudge or a prompting to respond to it, all you have to do is just respond by typing yes to the WhatsApp number below. And someone from our Autumn Ministry would love to come alongside and pray with you. And now, to give you a glimpse of what is happening in His Sanctuary of Glory, we will be having our encounter prayer meeting on the 17th of March. Now the Bible says that the prayer of a righteous man avails much. So what more the prayer of a righteous church? And last but not least, this year's weekend uh, during Easter, come and join us for both our Good Friday service on the 2nd of April as well as our Easter morning service on the 4th of April. Let us gather together to celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and remember that because of Him, hope is alive in you and in me. Amen. Now, let us seal off this week with the Lord's Prayer, shall we? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Keep us away from temptation and protect us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you have been blessed by today's service, please do not forget to extend this invite to your family and friends in joining us for our upcoming services. And please do not forget to like, follow, and subscribe to all HSG social media platforms. And please refer to the details on the screen. Thank you everyone and God bless. If you would like to receive prayer, inquire about joining HSG or a cell group, find out more about a service or course, or if you have just received Jesus into your life, scan the QR code now or head over to hsgmalaysia.org hello. We look forward to connecting with you.